All right, folks, a special edition here of Crancis Corner. Uh, this is a gentleman that I spoke to a couple times when I was doing the radio show with Joe Rose for all those years. And, of course, I let Joe do all the talking because these two are like best buddies. These two are like buddies. So I have Larry all to myself today. Larry, you're all mine. First off, <laughs> welcome to Crancis Corner. It's an honor to have you on here. Well, thank you. I enjoy it. And I just wanted to tell you this. Your memoir, by the way, head on. That's what I've talked to you about a couple times. I just mm -hmm. want to let you know that every time I see, I have all my books in my in my little bookcase over there, and every time I see the cover, it literally to me is like the best cover I've seen for a book to describe a person. And that face in the helmet of yours at the front of that cover is fantastic. So, with everything you've done for that memoir, the cover to me is probably one of the best things about it. That shot goes back quite a ways. Uh, Jim Kick and I, my running mate there with the Dolphins for years, Jim Kick. Uh, we did a promotional thing for Surrey's men's uh, clothes, a clothing store, and they wanted a shot, you know, right head on like a headshot. Right. It was kind of a hokey thing that we did, went out on the practice field and got down and they, you know, I put the helmet on. We did the whole thing. But it uh, it kind of reflects uh, what happens down at the one or two yard line when you're down face to face. And, you know, we wanted that kind of look and that kind of appearance. And I think if there's one thing that that team uh, in 72, particularly the team from 72 and the team in 73, had was that predictability, that ability to get that really tough yard, you know, when it comes down. Like this last season with the Dolphins, think about that. How many times when they were down third and short or third and goal and uh, things happen, we end up taking the field goal. A lot of things happen. I get into all that. I'm sure we'll get into it later. <laughs> That's reflective of that seriousness that you have to have down there at that thing. And I think that picture caught that. And uh, that's why it's we used it for the book uh, many years later. But it was actually a series men's clothes, <laughs> which is kind of funny. We'll keep that as our secret because I love it. Yeah, I, think it's such a, I think it's such a great picture. And literally every time I see it, and my dad comes over all the time and sees my book collection and sees that and goes, that is just the greatest cover I've seen. That just depicts Larry Zonka in such mm -hmm. a way. And I'm like, I know, I get it. I see it. And now I get to talk to you about it, which is even better. Um, and I'm bringing you on also, not just talking about the memoir and the Dolphins this season, but you got a nice honor coming up here in the Super Bowl coming up. Oh, you were yeah. the honorary trophy bearer. It's 50 years since, obviously, the 72, you know, the 72-73, the those unbelievable years down here in Miami. And you're going to have like a red carpet. You walk up with the trophy. All the players will be around you. They're surrounding you and you bring it up there. That's a really cool honor to have, Larry. I know it's been a while since obviously the I Dolphins. Have one fear. I have one fear, Zach. Tell me. When you get that Lombardi trophy in your hands. Right. And you walk up there. I'm just, you know, I've been thinking about it. I don't really want to give it up. You know, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I was really looking forward to handing it to a dolphin, you know. Oh. Larry. And then I thought, well, if the Dolphins can't, then maybe I can hand it to somebody from Detroit. You know, right. because our you know, coach George Wilson was an old, old uh, Detroit player and coach, and we kind of stemmed off of that, and then, uh, then all the things happened. But it would be nice to hand it to one, you know, a player from Detroit, and then that went down the tubes. And now I'm either going to have to, you know, Kansas City or that. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> It's just, I, I'm not, I don't want to hand it to them. You know, <laughs> Larry, we should make a plan. Well, just about what you're about to hand it off. I'll come through. I'll run. I'll grab it. We'll take it back to Miami and we'll sneak it back there. I'm perfectly fine with that. I think it would be every dolphin fans dream for Larry Zonka on the 50th anniversary to take, to hand that off to Steven Ross or Mike McDaniel oh, yeah. or Tua. Yeah. I mean, wow, you're right. That would have been a dream scenario exactly. for all of us, Larry. Zach, when they asked me to do it, you know, it was several weeks ago. And, you know, as we all know, as Dolphin fans, you know, you go back to the middle of the season, we look oh. like the number one seed. And then, you know, it's the worst thing that can happen to a young team is to be featured by midseason. I didn't like that at the time because it's better to be just in the running and maybe have a shot and then come right down to the wire. Uh, too much celebration too early, too much uh, accomplishment too early, if you will. Um, I, I don't I don't want to rain on a parade when they're doing really well. you got to be supportive even there. But even, you know, that's the problem with being an old NFL or, you know, from past experience, when it looks so one sided is when sometimes it 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 turns around and you start to mistrust that. And, you, you know, I, I I liked it at midseason when they were winning. I liked it better when they weren't winning by big scores because that that sets up that 
that upset possibility. And then think, right. just look what happened, though, Zach. Look what happened by the end oh. of the season. Now we're lucky to get in the dang thing. We're uh. really, it's like we owned it, you know, a month and a half earlier, a month earlier. It looked like we were the number one guys. We were coming right. in. And then several injuries, things happened some inconsistencies. Now it's shaky again because we'll look at our coordinators. You know, I we're know, at, I know. Larry, I'm with you. People offensively and defensively coaching. Right. We don't know. It's a little shaky at this point. So what happens from here? You know, if you're a Dolphin, if you're an avid Dolphin fan, this is a very shaky time because those coordinators are very, very important. And we have a you know strong possibility we might lose both. You know. Right. We, no, we might, I know. Now, Larry, what a heck of a place to try to – those are your your number one and number uh, 1A and 1B, your offense and defense. That's, uh, that's a big uh, – that's a big shift in, in personality, big shift in thought, big shift in the approach to the attack offensively right. and defensively with those people. So it's a very trying time. You know, it's going to be – well, it's going to be a question. Right. You know, Perfect way to answer be, that, right? Yeah, Perfect by the time right. we get in the training camp, it's going to be a question of you know who's in there. Hopefully, we'll keep one, right? And then, and then who are we going to put into the other, and how are they going to you know how are the players going to? There's a that's a that's a big position. That's a that's a part of your brain. You know, you right. know, brain surgery is a, a scary thing even now. <laughs> no, true. You know what? I'm laughing, but you're you're speaking you're speaking to the Dolphin Nation. Like I, you, you were literally. This is how the thought process is right now for the Dolphins. Going back to what you said at nine and three, going to be the one seed, and we're going to oh. host, and we're going to get the bye, and we're going to host a playoff game in week two in the divisional who's round. Who's going to come and play us? Right, right. Is who's Buffalo going to come play here? Us? Right, right. And now we've got oh. to go play them, and it did, that didn't work out. See, no. that gets, when you dictate terms because of your home field advantage, you know, and I know, Zach. He, you know, we've been down there standing shoulder to shoulder in the in, in the bowl when it when it was happening at home. There's an extreme advantage to playing at home in Miami, particularly. We got some of the most hard nosed, keen fans. They know when to holler and how loud to holler. It makes a difference. And you know, when you took when you, there's other teams that are like that too. Buffalo is a great example of right. that. Right. You play in Buffalo. Hey, you better bring your hearing aids. You know, I mean. <laughs> They they're not just fans, they're veteran fans. They're second, and third generation, fourth generation fans. They know when to holler and how loud to holler to affect the game. Right. And you get down to the close part of that stadium, and you you'll you recognize that. Back in the old Orange Bowl days, oh my goodness, you right. know you you had you had to be a mime in order to communicate. With anybody. <laughs> Right, I wish you, you almost you wish that all the know, players, we, yeah, all the players had those headsets in there, and there's just you could hear well, what was going on. Right, it, it, it's a different world. I mean, there was so much volume in that Orange Bowl when we were playing in '72 and '73 that it vibrated there. You know, you could you could hear the the water tank over there and the, <laughs> the pitch <laughs> vibrate from the sound. You know, people stomping their feet and hollering, and and then you knew when to do that. Yeah. We had very active fans, and uh, you know, I, I think that comes from being in Miami. A lot of people retire from different parts of the country and are avid fans in Buffalo or in New England, whatever. And they come down to Miami and they say, "Ah, well, we'll buy some tickets and go to the Miami Dolphins," and they become a Dolphins fan. Right, right. And now we have uh, we have some pretty intelligent fans down there. They know when to holler and how loud to holler, and it, right. it makes a difference. I, I totally agree. And, and and Larry, I was. You know, I, I was an 80s baby. I was born in 79, so I got to see uh, the 80s in, in the Orange Bowl. And let me tell you, I was born and raised there. That's how I grew to love football was my dad. And you'll laugh at this, too, because you probably looked up and saw it. My dad and my uncle had six season tickets on the fence in the Orange Bowl on, like, the 45-yard line. The fence where I would be rocking back and forth, and at any second I that remember. fence could give up, and I could have flown right out of that stadium. We'd come out of the locker room, you look up there and wave. <laughs> the you know, that was us. Funny. That was us. We, we loved I it. I, there was nothing like it. And, and I can't even imagine playing a game there, because obviously I didn't play a game there. I just rooted every Sunday or every other Sunday when we were there. And mm -hmm. I have never had an experience like that in my life. I only wish that I could bring my son to something like that 
once again in the Orange Bowl for one more game, one more game with that Dolphin fan Zach, base. That was, you know, that was a very back in the seventies, late sixties through the early seventies when we, you know, became dominant with the Dolphins and we got Coach Shula came in the whole thing. That was also a very trying time for the nation, you know, right. as far as cities and you know things that ghetto areas in the cities. Racially, it was a very divided: the Spanish, the black, the white, the you know the green, whatever. Everybody was down there, and right. and the Orange Bowl was right smack in the middle of the four corners of what I just described. Right. But what a great place to hold a football! What a great place to bring people together. And I think you know I I like to believe. And I do believe personally that the Dolphins team and Coach Shula coming in and turning it around and starting to be a winning thing, even before that, even before Shula came in, starting with my career back in 68, perhaps even earlier with Bob Greasy coming in at 67, and things started to change a little bit there. And people started to come together over a football team. Now, it's the, you know, sometimes the things that divide us are the most basic. Right ridiculous right and the most basic but some of the the things that bring us closer together are the basic things like sports enjoyment you know what because we all kind of do right. so we're all fans and that four areas of that city came together right there at the orange bowl and that started something kind of a city pride that kind of got people instead of finding differences they had something in common and i think i like to believe that that when we went through all that period of the 70s and 80s, that the Dolphins team had a little bit to do with why Miami was a less violent, more together town. And I think we did. And we, well, whether we were it or whether we were just part of that mechanism that brought people together, they had something that they had in common. And instead of all the things that they didn't have in common. Right. Dolphin it fans. Fun. Right. It was an honor to be part of that, you know, and see yeah. that happen. And of course, we were playing football. We didn't have time to think about all the social effects of all that. Right. But later on, you get you get retired. You look back at that and you think, you know, it was really neat to be part of that while that was happening. Yep. I remember all the people coming in the parking lot. My goodness, down there in that area, those parking lots are wide open to anybody <laughs> that wanted to walk in. All That's the, right. The way it was, not like today where, you know, there's security. And we'd get there, Jim Kick and I would get there like an hour, an hour and a half before, two hours before the game, and park the car and go in because we like to take his time and sit around and bullshit a little bit before <laughs> the game. And we would, uh, we had a regular fan club meeting out in the in the parking lot with all the kids. We got to know their names and talking to them. And, you know, we'd sneak, we'd take them in, we'd bring them in through the gate. We'd get the security guy, look the other way, and we'd bring the kids in, turn them loose in the stadium, you right. know, let them around the whole game. That was a lot of fun. And that was, uh, that was a good time in Miami. It was a, a good, positive thing in a very negative overall time for the country. That was a positive thing in Miami. I'm glad yeah. glad to have been a part of it. Uh, and, and, and Larry, you still are. Whenever we talk about those stories and we talk about that stuff, you're one of the first names that come up there. And and that's why I love having these these conversations with with you and and I used to have conversations with Jim Mandich all the time also because uh, I love so. Jim. You know, Jim was Jim was one of my favorites. I I met Jim through obviously radio when he was a radio guy, and I used to pick his brain. You know, other guys would talk to him about this and that. I used to pick his brain and ask him about that those teams and the locker room because I'm fascinated with the locker room kind of bonding situation and and how guys years and years later still friends or still didn't talk to each oh, other. Yeah. Like there's so much dogs. that goes on. Mad Dog Man is sat on one side. I mean, Joe Rose was one person down from me on the other side. He was on the other side of Jim Kick because our numbers, you know, in the office. Right. And uh, we sat there and used to just, Mercury was in there with us. And we, it was, we all kind of got there early and would sit there and BS before the game and talk about it. And look, Jim Kick loved to read the entire program before the, you know. Did this, he really? He wow. was an old sports fan, you know, right. when he was a kid up in New York or in New Jersey. You know, I went to different games as a kid, and he just loved reading the whole the, the whole program. I used to sit down next to him. I'd be putting my socks on or getting taped or, you know, before the game. So, you know, what, what do you read? What's so interesting in the program? He says, have you ever read one of these, Zunk? <laughs> you get mad at me. <laughs> but Joe Rose and Mad Dog, the conversation was uh, always uh, – Let's say stimulating. Yeah, uh, Joe Rose and, and uh, Mad Dog, they had different 
opinions of who we were playing and how we should attack. You know, everybody had their opinion. Didn't matter because Coach Shula's opinion is the one that we were going to use. That's right. That's right. But, but everybody still had it. But that that was a great thing about Shula is he got people thinking about it. Right. You know, and the worst thing he could do is uh, not not think about the details. No, of course. He was detail efficient, you know. Mm. I can only imagine with everything from start to finish, left, right, up and down, he had a detail for just about everything there. What was Coach Shula like? And, and this is a perfect transition to this. Those two Super Bowls, obviously you win those two Super Bowls and you lose one, so there was three Super Bowls. But what was mm -hmm. Coach Shula like this week, this week going into the Super Bowl to get your guys' minds right? Was he any different than he was during the regular season or anything, or was it just still the same I Coach Shula? We talked about this going from the Super Bowl, the first one we went to where we lost. Right. I told you the stories about how he got up and flew out there and watched the sun come up and documented where the sun was going to be in the Super Bowl the next year. I mean, there was no detail that was too small. So when you approach that as a player, when you encompass, you know, when you have a head coach that's that, that detail oriented. You know, he's trying to think of every possible thing that could happen that, you know, and so there's an answer. There's an obvious answer that's been rehearsed. So all you have to do is pay attention and be uh, brainwashed. Right, right. <laughs> this happens. This is why so you do X. And if this is X or this is Y, then you do X. X. If this is X, this is you do, do Y. You had to have, have that immediate response. He wanted that. Because that's total attention to the game. Then other things are going to happen during the game that alter that. But if you're looking for the one factor that made Shula Shula, yeah. it was that attention to detail. He believed the details would win the game. You know, if we were down, you know, third and one on the one or fourth and one on the one, he had thought about that. You know, he had not even just thought about that. He thought about which end of the stadium it might be and whether the sun would be in our eyes or in our back. You know, he thought of all those things. He played all of that in. Now, the intensity, the dedication to work. When you talk about people nine to five, you know, how much dedication do you have? How much of, how motivated are you to do a good job? Right. Now, do you care enough about it that you excel, that you do, do you feel like you've done 100% by the time you show up? Not many people can say that, you know, that's a tough thing to, it's an easy thing to talk about, but sure. it's a tough thing to donate or dedicate yourself to. And that right. intensity, if you caught his intensity and it was very infectious, you know, if you were around him long enough and you started to care, particularly after you lost him, like you alluded to before, and we talked before about Super right. Bowl VI, when we got our butt kicked, by Dallas, he instead of taking that and throwing that away and never wanting to talk about that, he wanted us to sleep with it. He wanted us glued to our ear for the next for the next two years. <laughs> that was his source of energy for the intensity that he needed to to get us and keep our attention on what it was that we should be focusing on. Right, and I think therein lies the secret. Yeah, uh, we talked a lot. We, uh, I'm just glad I'm still around. I'm still a Dolphin fan. I get to watch him. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. I, I see that this Dolphin team, what they did this year, they showed marks of championship. Right. I agree. Where they were at, where they were at halfway through the season, you remember with me what, you know, the pride we were all feeling. So that's reflective. That's starting to look like the old championship execution, the ability to pay attention to detail. Those things started to happen. Then they got some injuries. Then they started making some mistakes on the field. And we went from number one seed out to barely getting through the door. But that's okay as long as we learn from that. Right. right. As long as this year we enter it and we think about what happened last year. And we that's don't the only thing, right? The motivation, season. right? The motivation has got to be the biggest thing going into next season, thinking we were so close the last two years. Eight and three at one point, then the season, you know, two years ago, and the season kind of fell apart. This last season, nine and three, and then the season kind of fell apart. There's got to be a little bit of motivation going into this next season, thinking we're so close. We just need to jump over that hump in December and January when it really matters at that point. Um, have you got to speak to or sit down with Mike McDaniel at all, the head coach of the Dolphins? Once in a while, I get okay. to see him. You know, he's he you, you want to talk about polar opposite of Don Shula, right? 
I'm from another era. I you know, know, I know. <laughs> I'm appreciative that he recognizes that and has us come down on the sideline and stuff, but I don't have... Now, when you talk about intensity and seriousness, that transcends eras, you know, it's right. for the players to be that serious. But I, how, as a head coach, can you do that today? You know, times have changed. It's a different... Uh, it's a whole different approach. And, yep. uh, but if they, if, if you can capture that, if there's a little bit of, they, they can capture a little bit of that from the past and blend that into the current, it may lead for a great future. Got it. Because Larry, I hope so. You can get them to get that serious about it. If they want to do it that bad, if they want it just half as much as most of those fans, those third and fourth generation fans up in the stands want it. You know that there you go. You know, right, you right. Put in the time, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, you do you talk about what was as you're growing up and wanted to see that happen again. You want that from was to is. And I thought I thought the doors the doors are starting to open this season. But now with this thing with the uh, the co offensive defensive coordinators, right. uh, that's that's kind of shaky place. You know, you, uh, it would have been nice if that would have just gone on for another year and uh, learned from that experience this year about being in a strong, very strong place mid season and then right. falling off that much. That's a, that's gotta be a learning. They gotta be reminded about that. I'm afraid new people coming in might not be able to carry that history that we just learned this last season on. Right. No. And, and let me tell you one thing I've learned from this team too, and something covering the media for the last year, I've been in radio for tw almost 22 years now is the, the figures on the team sometimes uh, uh, take such a take a like a pedestal over other guys, and I've seen something happen. Now I, I've been a fan since obviously, what, like I said, Orange Bowl, Dan Marino days, Tony Nathan. Like those are th those are those are my teams that I grew up loving. The Miami Dolphins going to the playoffs every year, hosting games at home in the Orange Bowl, trying to get to the Super Bowl, getting to one, the whole deal. I have never seen in all the time I've been down here, outside of the years where Marino was just one of the greatest quarterbacks we've ever seen. A guy is polarizing in the news and media as the quarterback now for this Dolphins Tua. And the way he gets kind of dissected and everything every single season since he's been here, it's amazing what's happened with the media and social media and everything and how much this guy gets. What what have you seen from Tua in the last two years since he really became the big starter for this team with Mike McDaniel that you love or things that maybe he needs to kind of get better outside of winning in January and December? That's something we all agree on. He has to win those games. But what else have you seen from Tua that you like or think you, you need to improve a little bit on? Well, I, what I see the feature is the experience, the security of knowing he's got people around him that he can count on. Right. You look at his career from the time he came, each year he gets a little more of that. He knows who to go to and he knows when to go to him. And, you know, keeping them healthy, you know, that's a right. whole other picture. I don't know about that. That's a changed universe from where what we were back right. you know, when I was there. But that, when he turns and fires so quickly and puts it right on the fingertips, that's a two-way street. That's not just all him. Right. That, that guy that he's throwing it to, you know, they had that down by midseason. I was awed by it. But I was also hearing, you know, <laughs> those bells in the distance, you that's know, right. can be healthy can these things happen. But I think that we've got uh, what we need there at that position. I think there's several other positions that are filled now to keep those people healthy and get them through the season. But again, I'll say to you, you know, I would rather be on the brink of breaking through and a guarantee at midseason than being the feature. You right. know, I, I would like to be, uh, you know, in the running, but not necessarily way ahead at midseason. <laughs> Right, you know, no, that sounds crazy. Because no, it doesn't, Larry. It does, I'm superstitious. I'm, I, I'm with you on this. I, I swear. I, I felt it nine and three and eight and three in the last two seasons. I was like, it was kind of, and and maybe this is because of what's happened in the last twenty years here as a Dolphins fan. I was kind of waiting for the shoe to drop. I was waiting for something to happen, and that's not the way I grew up knowing the Dolphins. And but the last twenty years, you think about a a kid right now or an adult right now is 30, 32 years old. They don't know any different. They weren't there for Marino. They weren't there, obviously, for you guys in the 70s. And they don't know what Dolphin winning is. And it's, it's weird to me because I do not a Super Bowl win like in the 70s. I wasn't around in 72, 73. But I remember every year with Danny, mm -hmm. playoffs, home playoff games, Super Bowl contender every year. And then all of a sudden, the last 20 years as a Dolphins fan, it's like, 
Maybe we get to the playoffs, probably not going to win a game. It's amazing the generational gaps in Dolphin fans right now. And Yet, exactly. like you said, they're all exactly. the same way. There's things showing with these teams the last couple of years. There are there, there are baseline footer foundation things that are starting to show up. Consistencies that are starting to be there. Right. There's a reason they went all the way up to the the peak where they were about midseason. Now, granted, they learn. Hopefully, we'll learn from what happened last year, and we'll correct that. And right. this next year, we'll go up maybe a little slower, but we'll try to get to hit that peak at just the right time. You don't want to peak at midseason. You want right. to peak right before the the, the later. Right season, now, the playoff <laughs> season. Sure you want to peak at the playoff season. Right. And I, and I think each year that that our head coach has been here now, he's developed a little bit more. Maybe, you know, I'm afeard of this coordinator thing, but at the same time, there's, you know, that's a coin toss. It could be a very positive thing. Right. Instead of necessarily just a negative thing. I don't like it. No. If you got to deal with it, but you got to look at the reality of it. Could end up very positive, not necessarily negative. Let's, let's think that way and hope right. that it happens. And uh, when you talk about the fans and you talk about the fans of your era and on, there's still a lot of gray hair up in those. When I look up in those, I see some of the people that used to be kids. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the kids were. There's my bald little, spot. Larry, there's playing. my bald spot. Right. I was playing. <laughs> so there's, we have a just a fabulous blend of fans. And we're not the only one. Like I alluded to with Buffalo, you know, even yeah. New England. There's uh, people that or stadiums where I go and it's reminiscent of the, of the old orange bowl. But at the same time, we both know that we have the most avid fans, you know, anywhere in the country or right here in Miami. Yep. And the Dolphin fans have been so, uh, so dedicated. Yeah. I think the word I want, they're there game in game out and they stay, they get there two hours before and they stay for an hour afterwards. So you got to, you got to admire that, and you got to. I hope that we can serve something up this year. Me and too. I say we because I still, in my mind, I'm certainly not related to the team in any capacity anymore, and other than just being an old fart that likes to to watch and talk about the old days. But I, there's a feeling, and I, I, you know, even Bo Camp or some of those guys that are on that are very close to it and see it, you know, old pros. They're telling me it's coming. You know, you, you can see it building, and I hope that uh, I hope that stays consistent and continues to grow, because that embryo could really turn into something magnificent here in the next year or two. And I, oh I'm hoping- man, Larry, from from your mouth to, to the to football gods' ears, man, I hope this is. I hope you were right on that because nothing would be better. I, I actually brought this up to Joe. I remember a couple of years ago on the radio because we in the last 20, 25 years we've seen. The Marlins won a World Series. The Heat have won a couple NBA championships. Uh, the mm-hmm. Panthers have been to the Stanley Cup Finals. And I'm thinking to myself, I've seen parades for the Heat and the Marlins. Even the Hurricanes football team years ago, the parades for all these championships. I can't imagine nowadays what a Dolphin Super Bowl parade would be. You'd have to start it in Orlando, and it would have to go all the way down to Key West. Maybe even on a boat after Key West at this point, there'd be so many Dolphin fans ready to celebrate. We are way – the Dolphin fan base – it, it, it's it, it's like we're yearning for that one Super Bowl win again. We came back from Super Bowl uh, going undefeated seventy two. Right, Super Bowl seven. We came home. I did. I wasn't. I went on to the Pro Bowl and I didn't get to see it. And it's one of the things I, if I would have had any idea, right? We came. They came back. You know, I went on the Pro Bowl with some other guys, and I. But they called Jim. Several people called me, and said we had thirty five thousand people. At the airport, we had a, uh, for lack of a better description, a pepper rally after the game <laughs> when we arrived in the, in the Miami airport. They moved right. us over to a separate wing and just put all the fans in that wing because there was 30,000 of them showed up. Oh. <laughs> celebrated right there when the plane landed and the players got off. There was a big party going on at the, at the airport. Now, that... You know, think about that. There's one thing to have fans at the game and they, you know, pay their hundred bucks for their ticket or whatever. They're standing there and you got your, you know, beer, your popsicle, whatever. (laughs) But there's something else when five, 35,000 of them come to the airport to welcome you back and bring back the Lombardi trophy. And they, that 
that is a unity that few teams in the NFL have. That's a right. heritage that few teams have. Right. And we have it here in Miami. And I, I hope uh, what I'm seeing is it's starting to drift that way. And I, I, uh, I'd like to see that come all that come to light again, because yep. it's, a, it's a very positive, very happy thing in Miami. And I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to be able to relive that one more time in my life. Larry, if we get close to that thing, I will put you on my shoulders at the airport if I have to to get you there with me. You, you, you can you can hold my son, and I will hold you on my shoulders at that point. I'll be the happiest man here in South Florida, or one of the happiest men here in South yeah. Florida. Uh, Larry, have a great week. I know that you got this great thing uh, at the Super Bowl. You are going to be holding the trophy, bring it down the red carpet. I wish you were giving it, like we both said, to Mike McDaniel or Tua or any of the defensive oh. players. But we're past that at this point. But I'm excited for you. This is a really good celebration of that team for all the Dolphin fans also to see this. And it's a cool experience for you, I'm sure. You're going to do great, as you always do. And uh, this has been an absolute, for me, because I told you, I've talked to you a couple times, but I've never had you to myself. I always had to share you with Joe Rose. And Joe Rose doesn't like sharing you, so I want to join on myself <laughs> today. Uh, but honestly, thank you for your time today. Have a great week. Uh, have an awesome time at the Super Bowl. And your memoir, to me, one of the gold standards, if you're a Dolphins fan or just a football fan in general, to hear the stories that you tell in there, because they are A+. plus. I love hearing them, and I really, really, really appreciate your time today. Absolutely, Zach. See you later. I will see you later. That was Larry Zonka on a special edition here of Crancis Corner.